Well, welcome. I'm going to start now as much as I'd love to just sit and chat with with you all, but we are being recorded, so I think I better start on time. Welcome to the first share session of Journalism Advisor 411. I'm Janet Ewell. Journalism advisors are some of the best and busiest people I know. I'm grateful you are here. I'm grateful you're watching later from this. I hope if you are here that you are joining and you will join in the conversation. Because we are recording and archiving this, I think we have just muted you to keep down background noises. You are free to unmute yourself whenever you wish. We're grateful to Goodhart Wilcox for hosting this project. Abigail Hess created our digital resources, is engineering this session, and will archive it. We couldn't do it without her. This is the plan for our 45 minute session, and I hope you get to see my agenda. Can you do that for me, Abby? Yes, I am sharing now. One moment. <clears throat> there you go. Can you make that as for the slideshow so it's a little bigger? So we only have 45 minutes, so we're going to go quick like a bunny. I'm going to do about four minutes of welcome and update. Michelle Balmail has only about 20 minutes, so it's going to be like taking a sip out of a fire hose. After that, we will have about the same amount of time for questions, comments, um, questions for her, things that you would like to share that have worked well, uh, we can even arrange for you to share your screen if you have something you'd like to share. And then the last five minutes we're going to do from the floor where you have any announcements, requests like judges for write-offs or such things as that. Um, also, there will be a brief survey in chat if you have the time to hang out and do that before you go off to help guide us on what we're going to do um, as we grow this. Uh, three things deserve mention before we turn to Michelle. First is great news. West Virginia became the 17th state to pass a new voices law. The Republican governor, Jim Justice, isn't that a great name? He's six foot seven, I read. The Republican yeah. governor signed the bill, the new voices bill, on March 23rd. Student press rights is not a partisan issue. Now West Virginia college and high school students have the responsibility and the freedom to determine the content of the student press within certain narrow limits. Congratulations to Morgan Bricker and her students who helped make this happen. This is how the map looks now. And Abigail, if I could have the, uh, the slide of the, uh, the new voices states. If you're green, you're in a new voices state. 17 of us now, Hawaii is green also. If you're mm -hmm. not green and you would like to be green, uh, and especially if you have students with a passion for the First Amendment, the Student Press Law Center is hosting a digital New Voices Student Leadership Institute this July. I'll paste the link to that into chat. So if you have students, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th graders next year who would, would like that, uh, you can look at that. Uh, second, the JEA convention is next week. I look forward to it. I hope to see many of you there. Please say hello to me or to Michelle or anyone else you see on here. Uh, Michelle's our presenter today. We may, if all works well, offer you a yellow dot with J Advisor 411 on it and a QR code to our landing page. Um, so if you think that's something you'd like to share, at least let people photograph the sticker on your name badge. Um, that would be a wonderful thing. And then the last thing is a post from the Student Press Law Center's attorney, Mike Hestad, one of my personal attend, uh, heroes. It's about republishing artificial intelligence created content, <laughs> but it also about letters to the editor and guest opin opinion writers. And that would be the next slide, Abby, please. So I want to read part of his slide. Who is liable for AI generated content? Like any other content created by a third party, such as a letter to the editor, 
or a guest opinion column the moment you choose to republish something created by chat GPT or any other artificial intelligence content generator, you are legally responsible for it. If the AI generated material you post is libelous or infringes on someone else's copyright, for example, you cannot avoid liability simply by claiming you didn't create the content. <laughs> that post suggests to me the need for an, a new entry in our staff handbooks or maybe better yeah. staff handbooks. So 20 minutes is a very short time to cover any part of the subject that Michelle is doing. So I want to turn it over to her with a promise that we will we will come back and do more if there's more interest. So Michelle. OK, well, hello, everyone. Um, like I said a little bit earlier before everyone trickled in here, this is a little strange because it feels a bit like preaching to the choir. I know many of you and I know your publications or your past publications. Um, so hopefully like everything else. So I am a teacher and just one second, please. Hey guys, I'm starting. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, just so uh, you guys know when you go to a convention session, if you get one little nugget of something out of it, it was a success. Uh, so hopefully, even if you have a lot of previous experience and this is, you know, you're nodding with me along going, yep, that's, that's agree. Um, maybe you'll get something out of it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to set a timer. So if you hear Dexter, I know my time's up. Um, and let's go. Let's see. Screen share from here practice this here we go okay all right are you seeing a screen there mm -hmm. fabulous okay okay so my charge is to talk to you about how to get kids to go from words to design and really what that is is inspiration how do we find and use inspiration um, the focus today is kind of on print design, and I'm going to specifically use news magazine examples because that's the medium that um, I work in primarily, though I did just start advising yearbook last year, and that's a whole new world um, yeah. and a different kind of kid. <laughs> so they were arguing today about what color is journalism and what color is yearbook, and they decided that journalism is green and yearbook is teal, which I thought was cool. <laughs> Um, so let's, let's go. Um, so this is the mantra that I give my kids. I don't, uh, I know there are other versions of this out there. This actually came from my own advisor, Pete LeBlanc. And, um, when I was at a center high school in Antelope and he always used to kind of curmudgeonly say, stop designing from the sky, quit designing from the sky. Um, and so that kind of got just drilled into my head that, you know, we don't question if I'm trying to be the best basketball player on the basketball team, what do I do? I study the pros. Mm -hmm. If I want to be a great artist, I study amazing artists. Um, so then we have these journalism kids who come in or these yearbook kids who come in and what do they want to do? They want to sit in front of a blank screen on a computer and start drawing boxes and lines. Um, yeah. And then they search for the little thing that's going to make bold or italic or <laughs> let's change all the colors so that they can all be represented on the page. Um, and so this is really just kind of like the chant that, you know, you have to keep going back to is stop designing from the sky. Let's look at the pros. Let's study the pros. And then what I have found um, in my later years is I need to scaffold that a little bit more for kids instead of just saying, go study the pros, how do I even take something that looks so magical and professional and turn it into something that I can use? Um, so we, I'm going to show you an example, and then I'm going to just sort of walk through the design deconstruction process that I use. Um, and then maybe you all who have experience want to chime in and say like, well, we did this and it worked really well. Um, so this is a, the most recent, from the most recent issue of the magazine. That's called the whirlwind. And we always go through a process. Um, we call it the marriage of elements process. Again, I inherited that name, but um, some people call it the maestro process, um, the team process, whatever you want to call it. Um, but we 
always start with words, words first. Um, so the reporter will share, you know, this is my story, this is the angle I'm taking, um, and they begin the creative riffing process to come up with um, a headline that's going to capture the essence of that story. And so in this case, they were doing a um, an outdoors special, which special is like our features section, where it's one topic. Um, if you're a newspaper, you usually call it like the double truck or you know, <laughs> the, the true middle of your paper. Um, and so they're this kind of like, I don't, can you see my mouse at all or no? Mm -hmm. You can't? Okay. So the um, board you're seeing here, this whiteboard is their words session. So this is like their headline generating session and the things that they came up with um, for all of their potential stories. How's it going? Um, good, good. I think somebody Thank has you. their mic open. I'm not sure where. Abby, can you silence everybody except Michelle and then we'll uh, open. Sorry, there was yes. somebody really friendly sounding in the back. In the background. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like a fish. So like, I'm like, what did I hear? Where did it come from? Um, so this is their idea generating board. Okay. And then okay. over here are some inspiration in they came up with. Um, they like Pinterest um, and use Pinterest a lot, magazines a lot. Um, and then here is their spread. And so you're going to see some likenesses here. Um, you'll notice like they pulled, oh gosh, this is going to, this is going to test my abilities here if I can go back and forth. There we go. So they really liked this like transparent overlay. They liked the clean background. They liked the full um, image, um, just kind of like this very clean outdoorsy. They had landed as their main headline, um, a breath of fresh air. And so they were really looking for a design that was going to feel like a breath of fresh air. Now, when you look at this, it's not quite as cleanly executed as the professional version. Um, and it's definitely inspired. Um, some, in this case, I, I have a couple you know, colleagues who would say like, this is too close. Like maybe this is over the line. And that's always gonna be a question is like, is is there, you know, how close is too close? Um, you know, did we take inspiration or are we copying something? And I've noticed in the yearbook world, that's um, something you have to kind of be careful of and watch for because you don't want your kids producing a book that somebody produced last year. Um, so it's really tricky because there is inspiration out there. And I think with yearbook, it's even harder because it's easy to pick up a yearbook and say, wow and then just feel like, man, this is so pretty. I just want to do this. Like, this is this is what's in my head. Let's just do what they did. Um, so that's something that's like going to have to be navigated as you work from inspiration. Um, but yeah, so. OK, so how do we do it? Um, you stock your room with lots and lots of things for them to look at. Uh, these are pretty old now, but like the design annuals that um, the Society for Professional Designers used to put out, I love them. I buy them every year and um, kids love to flip through them. They always find the, you know, the half naked people in them, <laughs> usually from Esquire covers or something. Um, and then we um, subscribe to magazines. And so we regularly pull in and bring in magazines. Kids will sit in my room and just look at magazines and read magazines. Um, and then we have time carved out for them to actually create these plans. Um, so what you're seeing in this image up here is like they're um, in their sections and they each have a whiteboard and they're starting out with headlines and then they go from headline to concept and then they go from concept to visual. And that's the point where they go look for inspiration um, to use in their own design plan. The key here is that the design doesn't start when you sit at the computer. Um, and I think that's the mistake that a lot of kids make is they think I can sit in front of the computer and it's just going to come to me. I'm just going to start putting things on there. And that's when they fall prey to like clip art and borders and all of those things um, I I apologize if anybody advises middle school yearbook, but I tell them like, yeah, that's middle school yearbook. Let's not do that. Um, sorry. 
uh, I'm sure there, and actually there are lots of really wonderful middle school yearbooks out there, but they know exactly what I mean when I say it, because it's the collages and the borders and the, you know, kind of uncontrolled, um, unintentional decisions. So I'm looking at the clock. I think I'm doing okay. Um, I'm going to go through the design deconstruction process. So this is when I was talking about scaffolding. Um, so when I came here, we started a magazine uh, from scratch. Uh, there was a newspaper. It had died 10 years previous to me coming here and starting to teach here. Um, and we were bringing it back as a news magazine. So they had zero experience um, and no idea what we were doing. And I really didn't either because I didn't start my previous publication from nothing. Um, so that was hard. Um, but we, I began to realize really quickly, I didn't have that pool of veterans who could mentor kids coming up. And so I really needed to like teach them how to take a professional design apart um, and to see things the way I was seeing them after, you know, 10, 12 years of advising. So we call it design deconstruction. Um, and it's just an exercise that we run through pretty regularly to kind of practice, just like if you were you know, learning to play an instrument, you practice. So in the same way, we practice. Um, and what we'll do is we'll take something like this. So somebody will pick a professional design or I'll give them a professional design and we break it down into its component parts. So what makes this orderly? What is What makes it feel right? Um, and to do that, there are just four parts that we focus on. Um, so the first one we focus on is shape. Um, where do we see shape? on this spread? Do we see geometric shape? Do we see freeform shape? How is it being used? And so you can physically kind of go through and see where there is shape being used on this spread. So automatically they're starting to block out. Um, and, you know, in yearbook world, they call these like mods, um, you know, or alternative story forms, modular design. Um, but they're starting to see like, oh, this is not just stuff thrown onto a page there's there's some intention here then we go to lines um, and, and i ask them to look for lines where do we look for lines it's a good reminder of like line stroke and what's a real you know you might have a line that's not really a line um, so let's talk about lines um, so we have some implied lines right so we have lines like so we have actual lines we have strokes thin strokes here and it's being repeated throughout the, the spread, but then we have implied lines like, um, you know, there's sort of an implied line um, across here. I don't have to put a line there. Um, and your rookie like designers, what are they going to do? They're going to put a line there, like an actual line, and then they're going to keep drawing lines all over the page. And you're going to be like, pull it back, pull it back. Um, so this idea of a line that's not really a line for a lot of kids, I think, is just totally new and novel to them because um, obviously great design is great because it's invisible. It just exists and we don't have to think about it. Um, you don't see it because it's just sort of natural and feels right. Um, so we have implied lines oops, um, at the edges here. And then we talk a little bit about type. So um, font style size, arrangement, alignment, density, color. Um, this is this part can be a bit overwhelming just because there's so many um, different variations. Um, so it's really nice to kind of have them look at it first and then give them the language for it because they know what bold is. They know what italic is. You know, their English teachers are having them italicize their um, the titles of books in their essays. So they get those things, um, but they really are going to be unfamiliar with like letting, you know, the space between lines of text or kerning, the space between letters. They will see it and they'll have a way to describe it. They'll say like, oh, well, the, the letters are really spaced out. Um, but then that's where you can kind of come in and, and start to teach like, well, we have a name for that. You know, we call that this. Um, and they're not going to remember it the first time, but then after a while, you'll be not paying attention and you'll hear veterans in the room say like, oh, I think you need to adjust the letting on that text. And you're like, yes, score. <laughs> uh, somebody was listening to me. So we look at all the types of text choices that were made on that spread. And I, I think that um, in this case, it's kind of easier to, to do that by taking away from the page, right? So to get them to focus really in on 
wow, okay, so I've got this very bold, all caps, sans serif font up here, very condensed, it's like, er, smashed together. And I might ask them, depending on what we're looking at and what the purpose is, like, what does that feel like? You know, what does that type feel like? Oh, that, that type feels like it's in your face. Um, Mike, I have a, the same a group of kids, the features section um, is working on a feature package around uh, women's issues and feminism. And their core question is like, what happened to feminism? Um, and they chose as their design inspiration, like 90s teeny bopper girl magazines. And it's going to be amazing. I'm so stoked. They're excited. They like are you know, pulling old images out and, um, you know, but there's, they have to study them, right? If they're going to execute it and pull it off, they have to do this. They have to break it down. Um, so the last piece, so I'm just showing you all the different like types of text here. Um, whew, five minutes, 20 minutes goes by really fast. <laughs> Jan. Um, I know, so I know it does. And, and please don't cut yourself off. Just no, no, it's okay. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. That's my goal. Um, okay, so the last piece of this, you know, after you look at the type, and I think that it's important as well, you know, this is where you, you're also reinforcing things like contrast, right? What, why is contrast important? Um, how am I directing the reader around this spread based on decisions like size or style? And then the last thing is color. Um, how is color used or not used in a way that supports the content of the page? And I found that once my kids were designing in full color, um, which we have the luxury of doing, um, and I think a lot of us are now because um, it's, you know, full color yearbook is pretty much the standard. Um, I realized that they really want to use color, but they have a tendency to choose it in giant swaths like I'm going to put a just a big block of color um, and then I'm going to put another big block of color and another big block of color um, and it's almost like they're just you know coloring the page um, instead of thinking about color as like a way to direct a reader's attention so on this spread this is kind of actually an interesting one to talk about color because there are no blocks of color Right. So it's not there. Nobody came in here and drew a big rectangle and changed the fill. Um, but color is definitely a piece of this. Um, and we would probably talk about this as a way of highlighting the photography. Um, if you have great photos, I wouldn't necessarily call these great photos, but if you have great photos and then you're throwing a bunch of color around the page, what does that do? You know, what does that do to your photos? Um, is it complementing your photos? Is it supporting your photos? Or is it really like taking away from your photos? So um, in this one, the red text is an interesting one. Kids tend to like draw to that really quickly and, and debate why they chose red and was it the right choice? Um, but we do talk a little bit too about bouncing the color around the, the spread, right? So like having, um, there, it's not an accident that, you know, this person right here is wearing red and then there's red text here and there's red text here. Um, and then there's a, like a little tiny red dot down here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, so that's kind of the four pieces. Um, you could talk way beyond that. Um, and obviously you could start to throw in more advanced things as kids are getting more advanced, but I just think that like giving them those four things to look at really gives them a lot of tools to get from okay, we have this great headline, we have this inspiration, now what do we do with it? How do I figure out how to, how to recreate that? Um, I also think like breaking it down like this is going to lead them away from like straight up plagiarism because they're not just trying to copy the page, they're thinking about how the choices were made, how were these decisions, and then they can start to spin off of that and make it their own doesn't mean they're not going to, you know, run the large photo with the over text, overlaid text because they really love that look, um, but they're going to do it hopefully in their own way. Okay, that's all I have. <laughs> um, I know there are people in here who have amazing design experience. Uh, does anyone want to chime in or anything that you any advice that you have or things that works really well for your kids, I would love to hear it. Um, just just unmute yourself and talk. 
when when you excuse me, Michelle, forgive. Mitch yeah. is a person who could probably talk for days on this because he's <laughs> fabulous designers. I, I just saw Tracy had her hand up, so yeah. I can call on people, or or I can just have people go, yeah, yeah, me too. Whichever you. Well, I'll start then since you saw my hand, Jan. Um, I saw in one of your slides, um, Michelle, you had create a whiteboard culture. And I've got to tell you, one of the best things that I had in my classroom is every single wall that did not have a window or a um, screen on it had a was painted with whiteboard paint. And that gave the students the ability to walk around and sketch things out and put a big save on there for things that they liked. But two people, you know, or three people would sketch out where they thought something would go at the same time, too. So lots and lots of uses. And especially as we're coming up towards summer, believe it or not, you know, this might be a time to think about if you know where your classroom space is going to be next year to get those walls painted. They take about a week to cure, follow the instructions on the paint thing. Um, but it's great. And we actually used blue tape on there, too, so they would actually type tape out grids and everything else. Brilliant. Yeah, we got um, rolling, those rolling standing whiteboards with some CTE money, and it made a big difference for them to all be able to stand around the whiteboard. Um, almost always they're standing up at those whiteboards, which is really cool because it's a very kind of egalitarian process. Everybody's involved. Everybody's part of it. Um, and it allowed them to work independently. They're not all crowded at the front of the room. Um, so that's been great. Mitch, Mitch had a hand. May I? Go, please yes. go, Mitch. So, you know, it's so funny, um, Michelle, because, of course, I've worked with Pete for more than 30 years. So what your presentation, I've seen in, you know, a version of his as well. Um, and I would do much the same thing. I think the biggest, the best resource for students is the public library because they almost all have collections of magazines. And um, I can't tell you how many times that saved us over the years. The fact is I'm not a designer. My kids would learn the basics, but a couple of times I had to jump in and, and work with them. And I would, you know, the most I've ever done with any yearbook staff was I found a bunch of inspiration. I mean, I think it was all from Allure magazine, which had great typography and great graphics. And the, once the kids saw it, I said, I'm, you know, and I did it in conjunction with a lot of ideas and, and they just began to take it and they ran with it um, and ended up with one of our best design books just because they just needed the inspiration, which is the key concept here. Find design inspiration. So I really liked your comment that your kids got better at it than you did. Or uh, am I right? I mean, that don't mean to insult you, but uh, oh my God, there's the so tools much. to deconstruct. They yeah, when my editor, when one of my when my editor design won the uh, design of the year contest, she would still ask me for my opinion. I would look at it, I go, Chelsea, you passed me by so many <laughs> months ago. It was ridiculous, and, and I mean, I was I felt good that they, she would ask me, but. I, you know, I have good taste, but they're better designers than I am. I, I just can tell you what, you know, if I give me two designs, I can tell you which one's more effective. I'm not that, I'm not the designer. I'm a word person. Some and Ingrid in a, in a, said she loved the deconstruction method. And then, I'm sorry, who is going that to? That was me. I was just going to chime in and say something interesting that's different now than when I started was, um, is that kids obviously use their phones a lot more. Um, but they take pictures of everything. So they take pictures of their inspiration. They also take pictures of their whiteboard. They take pictures of their notebooks. And what we've kind of gotten in the habit of doing is the, the doc where the story is planned and written and their notes are, it's this one kind of master doc for that story. They throw the pictures in there. Like we want to see them. Um, and I think that's really important because you can influence them early enough in the process that if you see they're kind of headed down a direction that is, um, you know, you're like, oh gosh, I don't know if that's gonna work. Um, you can have an editor kind of sit with them and, and go through it with them and say like, okay, how are you, how are we gonna do this? Or what are you thinking here? Um, instead of, you know, 
it's the end of the production week, they're putting it through edits and then it's just too late. Like it's, you know, and you're you, either you catch it there and you crush a kid because they spent all this time doing it and it's terrible. Or the, the other end of that is you run it as it is and it's terrible. <laughs> so, and, and that kind of can crush them too, because it's not, you know, it's not great work. And so, um, that has changed a lot for us trying getting those images into a place that's a shared kind of digital space so that it can be commented on and they can be advised and they can get feedback before it's like too late in the process. Trip, I see your hand. I hope I have not missed anybody <clears throat> else's. Um, yeah, I was just going to follow up on what Mitch said about inspirations that um, huh, Monday we will finish our yearbook and Wednesday we will start. Yeah, well, fingers crossed that we get done on Monday. And then Wednesday, we will start planning for next year by looking at everything from magazines to award-winning yearbooks from many years past, not just the most recent, to old yearbooks, to anything they can find online, and grabbing images, like you, Michelle said, taking pictures of them, screenshots, and then we just start lumping them into a giant Google slideshow and everybody has access, they can put their images in, they can say what they like about it, and they end up all over the map. But we spend weeks doing that and refining it and then kind of uh, coming to some consensus about what we like and where we wanna go for the next year and that sort of thing. Where do you get the budget to, do, to buy? I mean, Mitch said he sends kids to the library and I know you're getting a lot of things online, but designing online is different than designing on paper. Where do you get the budget to buy magazines and acquire the design yearbooks and things like that? Well, the thrift store is an amazing place for magazines. There are a lot of people who, you know, they want them out and so they cycle them out. And so I'll go periodically and just collect a bunch. And I think they, at this point, we're at the point where they sell them for like 99 cents a piece. Um, but I personally subscribe to a lot of magazines. I read a lot of magazines. It's one of my preferred methods. And so I just bring them in. Um, the SPD annuals, um, that was, you know, bought through program funds. You know, we're fundraising just like we would buy, you know, other equipment. It's, it's equipment. It's the same thing I had. I had to argue over because um, our CTE regional coordinator did not believe that whiteboards were... Um, like essential and thought that because we were trying to use Perkins funds for it. And he was like, you can't use Perkins funds for that. And I said, you know, come watch how we're going to use it. And then tell me that they're not essential. We use them every single day. Um, way more than that 3d printer gets used that was bought for that other program last year. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we, we were able to convince them that that was, you know, something we need, but, and sometimes people will chime in on those Facebook groups and say like, Oh, I have this money. What should I buy? And, you know, there's a lot of like, buy a bigger lens, buy a better camera. And those things are great, but buy a whiteboard that stands up and rolls around. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I am not kidding. It's a game changer. Abby, I hope you're able to capture all the, uh, all the the chat comments because there were just like five great suggestions that went by in there and and I'll read them at the end of the after we're no longer uh, no longer officially recording so that it all gets in there. Mitch says don't look at other yearbooks for designs. I would say if you if you don't look at any yearbooks that have been done in the last ten years, you're probably safe. Yeah, Mitch is fresh examples. Yeah, I would, I, I'm just a starting out yearbook advisor. And um, I think Mitch is right. Like when you're in the process of designing your own book, don't go to other yearbooks. I think it's great to study them and see what works and, um, you know, what makes a spectac spectacular yearbook. But oh man, it is so tempting to just do what they did because it yeah. looks so good. <laughs> Who yeah, wasn't? I, I just couple. missed it. Mitch and Tripp were saying one of them got their best yearbook by copying one of the others, and it just went by too fast for me to catch. I'm sorry. Who wanted? Just go. I I can't oh, see. Oh, that's, a, that's a shame, Tripp. Um, but um, I sort of feel like yeah, it's important 
not to re I would use other yearbooks for looking for innovations of coverage um, and story form ideas and things like that, because that's not really material. It's just storytelling that perhaps you're mm -hmm. taking. Um, the adaptation, you know, and I've seen Redondo yearbooks all over the place, not not with the Redondo name on it, though. And it's <laughs> it's nice. And I showed I would show it to my students and they would like that. But um, you know, it's more, it's more contemporary when you find, let's say, a cool design element out of a magazine. And the and the libraries, it's not you don't even go to the library. They're all online. They have mm -hmm. their magazine collections online. And just like what Michelle said earlier, all they're doing is you're taking screenshots and they, you know, build a, a sense. We used to do um, design notebooks, but now it's all about doing a digital design notebook. And, you know, you look for, um, and, and you just look for really good stuff. Um, Trip, you just mentioned Pinterest boards and they can be great, but be careful about your search terms because a lot of times <laughs> you'll find old, inspiration that was used in a bunch of yearbooks. And and okay. and that could be a little problematic. There's also, um, and I forget the name of the website, someone here will know, is it Behance? Um, a collection of graphic designers um, and look at their work. I don't know if Behance is the program, but um, as I said, someone in this room must know what I'm talking about. But finding um, up and coming graphic artists and, and looking at their examples and, and look at what they're doing with type in particular these days, because types become super graphic um, yeah. and really interesting. Can I can I add a question from Alicia? We tried it using. Do you say issue I S S U U? You know where the, mm -hmm. which is a, a an online archive of at least a lot of student publications. We tried using issue this year, and it seems so much of it is under firewall. Does anybody know about that? not being able to get to issue. Um, I know that they have placed their business model, their income model changed and allowing people to embed their um, publications on their website changed so they don't yeah. have that anymore. But if you search the site itself for other publications, you can get kind of a sense. It just kind of depends. I found that issue is a little bit spammy now. I don't know if that... Oh. Um, so it's a little hard to dig through because there's a lot of just kind of same thing with Pinterest. There's just like a lot of fake stuff there um, that, you know, you dead. The thing on Pinterest is you click the link and it takes you to something else entirely. And, yeah. you know, OK, so this is this is spam. Yep. So Adriana Chavira, who I hope we'll hear from at another session. My students use a Padlet as a design notebook. Uh, mm -hmm. Alicia has Behance, www.behance. I hope you're looking at the chat um, and if seeing if there's anyone that I really want to, to uh, I, I, another person saying the deconstruction method is good. This, this shape, line, color, type gives your editors language with which to talk to your baby designers, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So before I, we've got about a minute and a half and then I promised to do a, uh, a from the floor if there was something that anyone else wanted to add. Does anybody want to say a word about copyright infringement? Are we worried about that on, on this design stage? Tracy, speak, please. <laughs> You cannot copyright design. Oh, OK. Yeah, so no problem there, except for whether or not you want your book or your publication to be original. So there you go. <laughs> very good, very good. I knew it was the right place to ask. So on this last, thank you very much. This this conversation, I'm glad it's being recorded because it's it's very valuable for anybody who's coming to look at this. I think even as a as a die in the wool word person, if I had to somebody plopped me down in a yearbook classroom, I think using shape line color type, I could I could launch the kids to get better than I am at it. And I I, I think that was 
just very helpful. So the last five minutes, time for your announcements, including sessions you are presenting at the JEA convention or summer institutes or any requests for help, like you need somebody to hook in digitally to help judge a write off or something. Um, anything else that's on your mind? And also we have two or three questions that are going to show up in the chat. One of them is about the length of time for this. One of them is two possible topics for the next session. And uh, the third is the the ratio of presentation and discussion. So so if there's anyone who wanted to share anything or announce anything from the floor, please just unmic yourself and and uh, and come in and do that. Crickets. I'm doing two sessions at the JEA. One of them is covering issues of disability. Uh, which has just warmed my heart so much because I used to get nine kids and now I get 90. They care and they really want to to make sure nobody's invisible at their school. And the other is covering the hard stuff where we will talk with the kids about struggles they are having or had and what they've done. Boy, that one goes all over the place and I'm doing that with Hillary Davis. And have you seen the um, the survey in chat has that shown up for you? Abby, can you do that? I'm I have a quick one. Just uh, I'm going to be doing the outreach academy with about 20 advisors, uh, which is pretty big for outreach outreach academy. Um, if anyone has resources that a you know first through fifth year advisor would appreciate having. Um, please feel free to send them my way and I will uh, include them. Um, or if you um, want to connect with people, I know some of you are NorCal and some of you are SoCal and some of you are not Cal. Um, so if you um, are interested in knowing who's participating so that you can network with those people and find them and make them feel welcome and included, um, I would also be happy to share those names um, with you folks or whoever from your local organizations would want to know that. Okay, and so I have, sorry, I have two presentations uh, at the convention as well. Um, one of them is on brainstorming and specifically for small schools. Uh, Cause I like my school is like 220 kids. And um, I think my students do a pretty good job of creating content for all our publications on a regular basis. Um, and then the second one is one on media literacy and specifically more on um, helping students um, try to double check to make sure that, you know, what they're looking at is not AI generated because now we're looking at a lot. They're getting very sophisticated in that. Uh, so that's one that um, I'm doing as well. Excellent. Adriana, it's always good to hear from you. Alicia, speak. Don't just don't just put it in there. On, on, let's hear from you. I didn't want to interrupt anybody, and I felt it was a shameless plug. But um, several of y'all of you are story. already. Pardon. Oh, okay. Several of you are already mentors. Um, we have about a third of the mentor to mentees. Like we're one in three, so we're hoping that. Um, one of our new goals is to see if we can get mentors in every state. Um, to me, that is not as high of a priority. I think the one good thing that came out of the pandemic is this um, kind of community is that we can do it through Zoom. Um, Melissa is in Texas, that's why she was given to me. But if you look at the map, she's like seven hours away from me. Um, I'm not gonna pop into her classroom anytime soon. Um, but I just think that I don't want you to be afraid that if you can't do it from where you are, Zoom works perfectly and text messaging works just as easy. It doesn't even have to be a big time consume. They just need to know someone's out there like we all did in our first couple of years. So I will be a JEA. I am possibly co-teaching with Melissa, who's in this chat, my other mentee and um, to mentor pro, uh, sessions so i'll be there find me yes i've actually looked at when you're when you're presenting i've got i've, I've got you at nine o'clock on saturday morning new advisors yes that's with randy she is actually leading it she is one of my uh, mentees 
Oh, so I'm I'm kind of I'm being I made both of my mentees teach a session. I told them I would be there for mental, I mean, for whatever, just support. May I ask you to please take a minute and look at, at the uh, at the survey? I want, thank you, Alicia, by the way. I tend to jump from things, so put up with me. Uh, would you please look at the survey questions? Um, and I'm not going to go anywhere and we're not going to close this off, but this is officially the end of the recording and the uh, and the and our session one of our questions is is 45 minutes okay because you guys are really busy people